All right, good afternoon and welcome to Historic Preservation Advocacy at the federal level um, put on today by the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. We're really excited to have you all here today um, and to have Russ Carnahan from Preservation Action join us and talk about some of the upcoming legislative issues that we should be aware of as preservationists or people who just really enjoy our older places and our, our community and believe in the economic impact of historic preservation. So welcome today. My name is Mallory Bauer and I have the privilege of serving as the Education and Communications Manager for the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. Today we're going to be using Zoom for our webinar experience. I'm sure many of you are really familiar with this software, but just a few um, brief uh, housekeeping things before we dive in. We will be using the Q&A box to collect questions throughout the presentation. So if you have any questions um, and you're unsure where the Q&A box is, it might be in your toolbar, which might be minimized at the bottom of your screen. So you'll just wiggle your mouse. That should pop up. There's two little bubbles, talk bubbles, um, and it should say Q&A. Click in there, and that's where you can type in your questions. Um, we will have some links shared in the chat box if you feel comfortable and want to open that and, and look uh, and see what's available there. But all questions should go in Q&A. We, we do have some polls that I will pull up in just a minute. I do hope that you will take a moment to complete them. It just allows us to see who's in the audience. Um, and we're really excited um, to be here and we hope that you will enjoy the webinar. There will be a survey at the end of the webinar. Um, there'll be a link that'll pop up. I hope you'll take a moment to complete that. We do take into consideration everyone's comments when we're planning our future educational opportunities. And if you aren't available to do it today, that link will be shared in our follow-up emails as well. So don't worry about that. If this is your first time joining us for one of our webinars and you're unfamiliar with the Michigan Historic Preservation Network, we are the statewide nonprofit and our mission is to advocate for Michigan's historic places that contribute to our economic vitality, sense of place and connection to the past. We are a membership driven organization and we do hope that you will join us and become a member today. Uh, we have a lot of great information at our website and I hope you'll explore it at www.mhpn.org. And then also our webinars are supported in part by an award from the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and a grant from the Michigan Preservation Fund with the National Trust um, for Historic Preservation. Um, thank you so much for, we wanna thank them for their generous support. We couldn't do these uh, webinars without their support and your support. We just wrapped up our end of the year campaign um, and we appreciate everyone who contributed uh, to help ensure that these free webinars continue into the future. Um, so I am going to pull up the polls real quickly uh, before I turn it over to Mark Bradman, who is our executive director, and he'll be doing a very brief um, update on the Michigan uh, State Historic Tax Credit Program that was recently reinstated at the end of last year. It's just going to be a very brief update. We won't be taking any questions about that topic, but we just wanted to provide this opportunity to connect with everybody. Um, so first, before First poll question is, have you ever contacted a state or federal uh, legislator? So uh, either a representative, a senator, it doesn't have to be a preservation related topic. It could be any type of outreach. And we'll leave that up there for just a few seconds. All right. So we have, um, Many of in our in our uh, in attendance have ex that experience, which is great. If you are uh, have not, that's all right. You're in a good crowd, um, and we'll be uh, talking about how that is important. And how you can get involved. Additionally, we just wanted to find out who is in our audience. Um, so if you, uh, what is your role in historic preservation, um, be that your uh, career or if it's just a passion, uh, both, are, both are great. All right. So 
we have a, a good mix of individuals. So we have um, the nonprofit, the municipal, our government, um, professionals and architects, and uh, those who are, who, are, who are passionate about place. That's great. And then our last one is, have you signed up for Preservation Action's free advocacy update? And I will put a link to where you can sign up for those advocacy updates in the chat once I turn it over to Mark so you can find that information there. All right. And as you can see, we have a lot of people who are already signed up and already uh, keyed into some of these issues, which is awesome. Um, and that's really exciting. Okay, so that's all the questions that I have for all of you. I'm going to turn it over to Mark Rodman, who is the executive director of the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. Well, I want to first off, thank everybody for joining us today and, and for your interest in um, advocacy for historic preservation. And one of the things I just want to mention about the tax credit, which we're very excited to have back in Michigan, is that it really took all parts of advocacy to make that happen. Um, we had a great lobbyist who went in and, and worked with the legislators to kind of get us set up and get us positioned to move this tax credit forward. But in doing that, not only um, did we need her out there working, but we needed people in the legislator, our sponsors for working with. For instance, when we got to, ready to try to get the bill through the Senate, there was a lot of concern about the bill in particular because it was going to take money from the state treasury when at the same time the pandemic was hurting the state treasury and we didn't have the money that we needed to have in doing that. So one of our sponsors, uh, Senator Wayne Smith, he lobbied to make sure there was money in the budget that accounted for that state tax credit. And that is largely why we were able to get that budget passed, I mean, the bill passed because it was in the budget. The, the senators knew where the money was coming from. It's not like we're taking money from our budget that we're struggling with anyway. It was actually in the budget and that really helped get it through the Senate. But when we got to the House, the problem was that people had advocated against the tax credit saying that, you know, because the cap was so low, it wasn't, it wasn't worth having a tax credit this time. And our position through this whole time was we may start off with a small cap, but once we prove that tax credit is actually bringing more money back to the state than it's taking away from the state in the credits, then we should be able to get that cap raised. Well, what turned that over was people like you, the grassroots advocacy that got out there and said, we need this credit, it's important to us, we want this credit even with a $5 million cap. Had it not been for people calling and emailing and putting in cards for the hearings uh, for the House, this bill would not have passed. And so I think it really is a great case study in how you get a bill passed because we had a good professional out there, we had great sponsors, and we had good grassroots support that pushed for this. So it really is impressive how it came together for the tax credit to pass. And I want to thank all of you for being a part of that, for helping us make that happen. One of the big questions now is what happens? We're ready to apply for a tax credit or we know somebody that's ready to apply for a tax credit. When are we going to be able to apply? Well, one of the things the law calls for is rulemaking and how the process will work, which, you know, some people are like, gosh, do we have to go through all this? Is it really that important? But it is, because one of the things you don't want to do with legislation is write in all the details. So if something doesn't work exactly like you think it will, you have to go back and go through a whole new process and get the bill changed legislatively to get that small change made. So the, the bill allows for that. Well, a lot of the application process, how you get your tax credit, once you've uh, completed your project, how you uh, transfer your credit, all those type of things are left to the State Historic Preservation Office to fill out, figure out. But the nice thing is, we're not just giving it to a bunch of people in the State Historic Preservation Office and saying, figure this out. The, the uh, rulemaking process is a public process, and they'll be looking for your input on the suggestions that they have for all these different processes. So we're hoping in the next two weeks, they're going to announce this calendar of when that process is going to go forward. And we'll make sure we get that out to everybody because we want you to look at their processes. We want you to make comments and suggestions because we want the process to be as smooth for everybody as it possibly can be. That being said, because they do have to go through this rulemaking process and there's time commitments as far as what they have to have for people to have a chance to have public comment and they have to have public meetings and these type of things, we're expecting it's going to probably be June or July before the, um, the applications will begin being accepted for the tax credit. So it's unfortunate, but I think it's a good thing because I can tell you when we went through this process in Colorado when I was there a couple of years ago, 
things actually changed with the rules by what the public said during the rulemaking process. And I imagine that will be the case for Michigan as well. So anyway, thank you guys so much for being here today. And I'm excited about turning our eye toward federal legislation for a change and very excited to hear what Russ and Preservation Action has to say. So with that, Mallory, I'll turn it back over to you to introduce Russ. All right, excellent. Thanks so much for that uh, brief uh, update on the Michigan State Historic Tax Credit. And now I want to turn it over to um, Russ Carnahan, who is the president for Preservation Action, which is um, an organization at the federal level that keeps their eye on federal issues that are um, important to historic preservation. And I'm going to let Russ describe more about Preservation Action and himself, but take it away, Russ. Thank you so much for being here today. We're pleased to have you. Thank you, Mallory. It's great to be with you and uh, Mark and uh, all the folks with Michigan Historic Preservation Network um, and to be talking about advocacy at this really important time. Um, I wanna give a shout out too to our uh, Historic Preservation uh, Action staff, uh, Rob Naylor and Bruce McDougall, uh, who do so much work for us. Uh, our board chair, uh, Bree Grosecki, uh, and we have uh, three national board members from Michigan, Nancy Feingood, Kathy McKino, and Steve Jones. So we really appreciate their leadership and their service on our national board. Uh, and finally, just a big congratulations uh, to Michigan uh, for passing the uh, state historic tax credit. Uh, I'm, my home state is in Missouri. We've had one for some time and uh, where it's done, had a lot of impact here in our state. But now Michigan becomes the, uh, my understanding is the 38th state uh, to have a state historic tax credit. That's a record number. And uh, we think that uh, is just a great compliment uh, to the federal historic tax credit uh, and the great uh, impact, uh, economic and cultural impact that uh, these tax credits have and what a great tool they are uh, to achieve uh, historic preservation goals. Um, many people ask me about how I got involved in historic preservation. Um, and uh, one of the stories I tell is uh, growing up, I was always fascinated with uh, buildings, homes, barns, walls that were made out of stone. And only in recent years, I found out uh, from some genealogy research that my last name, Carnahan, uh, which is Scotch-Irish, uh, is roughly translated uh, to be man with a pile of stones in his field. And so I think maybe part of my fascination with uh, things historic is genetic, uh, but uh, also early in my uh, professional career, I grew up in a small town outside of St. Louis named Rolla, Missouri, and there was a big debate about a historic uh, train depot uh, there in town. And unfortunately, the city leaders at the time decided to tear the historic building down. And it really got, it really mobilized the historic preservation people in the community. And uh, not too long later, uh, there was a big debate about what to do with our historic Civil War era courthouse. And it was set to potentially be torn down when they built a new courthouse, but the historic preservation folks came together to save that, preserve it. And uh, that was really my road to getting involved in preservation. And then I served in our state legislature where we were involved in preserving and enhancing our state historic tax credit. And then when I was in Congress, uh, I became uh, the bipartisan co-chair of the Historic Preservation Caucus uh, and work with, with preservation action and many groups around the country uh, on historic preservation uh, advocacy work in policy and funding in Washington. Uh, so when I left Congress uh, in 2013, uh, a few years later, I reconnected with preservation action, became involved with them uh, as their president since 2015. So I'm really pleased to be joining you here today. Um, and uh, if you could go to the next slide, Mallory, uh, Preservation Action is, is really the grassroots um, historic preservation organization uh, going back to the early 70s, uh, really focused on 
lobbying at the federal level. Um, and we take that very seriously because there's great power in that network of individuals and organizations around the country uh, to build relationships uh, with their legislators in Washington to effectively maintain the country's uh, national historic preservation programs that primarily are based uh, in the uh, National Historic Preservation Fund, uh, the National Historic Tax Credit, um, and others, but those are the, the really fundamental foundation of the National Historic Preservation programs. And even during uh, these tough times with the pandemic and the economic downturn, we've been able to successfully make the case of the economic impact of historic preservation on jobs and businesses uh, at these, you know, during these critical times. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. The uh, another uh, recent example, um, uh, many of you, I'm sure, followed the uh, prior administration's uh, proposed changes to the National Register of Historic uh, Places uh, process processes, uh, and, and many of those changes were, um, were clearly harmful uh, to the process. And during that long process, a lot of leaders and organizations weighed in uh, during appropriate public comment periods. And even recently in the, most, in the last uh, month or so, uh, there were some final interviews uh, going on uh, at the close of the last administration. And we just got uh, great news uh, just recently uh, that through that administrative process and through thousands of people uh, providing their input in, in expressing concerns about these proposed rule changes, uh, that those changes uh, will not be implemented. So again, it's just a great example of, of large numbers of people, leaders from around the country uh, weighing in based on their expertise and their knowledge of historic preservation and the impact in their communities. And uh, people in positions in government listening and learning uh, to that input they received uh, and then making a, a decision that was definitely uh, pro-preservation uh, based on uh, you know, great statistics and experience that we've been able to share. So. Again, thank you to uh, the many people and organizations that were involved in that process. It uh, really helped uh, stop uh, this attack on what's been a very successful program, uh, and we're pleased to see that. Let's go on to the next slide. One of the other things that we have uh, instituted in recent years uh, through preservation action uh, is a congressional candidate survey. And we've done this now the last three congressional election cycles. And the purpose of the survey uh, is one, to educate candidates and their staffs when they're in the candidate stage of going to Congress, learning about the historic preservation programs, their impact in their communities. Uh, but then secondly, asking them to make uh, commitments to support them. And what we've seen is uh, really in a bipartisan fashion uh, that uh, there's been strong support from both political parties. Um, and it's really given us a, a good understanding uh, during that candidate phase that House members go through every two years, uh, Senate uh, you know, the Senate uh, every uh, six years through their term, that these programs uh, are understood, uh, uh, they're valuable, you know, to the history and culture in their communities, uh, their value to economic development and uh, tourism, uh, just on so many levels. And uh, these uh, programs really make an impact and policy matters, uh, which gets back to advocacy matters. So uh, we've been very pleased to see uh, these positive results. And you see a couple of the numbers here. 
81% uh, support increasing the historic preservation fund. 89% uh, believe the historic tax credit should be enhanced. 96% support consideration of historic resources um, in, uh, in planning. So again, very strong numbers of support of historic preservation issues and programs. Uh, oftentimes, the challenge in Washington is not that the programs lack support, it's that they, uh, there's so many issues and so many challenges going on that, that there's so much clutter uh, that it's hard to get to some of these issues. So again, it gets to the point of how important it is to uh, have citizen advocates engaged in this process, building relationships uh, with their members of Congress and their staff uh, to uh, provide this information to them. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. So one of the things that uh, the key programs that historic uh, uh, preservation does every year, uh, preservation action, uh, working with the uh, SHPOs, their national organization, uh, and other groups from around the country uh, have a, a great history and track record of having a historic preservation advocacy week. Uh, it has uh, traditionally been uh, every March, uh, actually in the first week of March of 2020, I think we had one of the last in-person events in Washington uh, before things shut down due to COVID. Um, but it's been a very successful um, gathering of historic preservation leaders from around the country. Um, we have training sessions uh, in, uh, we have featured speakers from uh, Capitol Hill, from the House and the Senate. And uh, we have a Hill Day where people disperse across Capitol Hill and go visit their congressional offices uh, in sharing the priorities of historic preservation, but doing it in a localized way. We're, you know, armed with uh, statistics and data and examples of, uh, of historic preservation highlights in their state and in their district and how these federal programs really help promote that and impact that and improve the lives of their constituents. Uh, this year, uh, mark your calendars, uh, March 8th to 11 of 2021, uh, we're gonna have uh, not just our annual historic preservation week, but it's gonna be the first virtual uh, historic preservation week. And so that really is, it's a challenge in some ways, but we expect uh, many of the leaders who have been involved uh, to be involved again in this virtual setting. But we also think there's a great opportunity uh, for many people who may not have been able to travel to Washington in the past for an in-person visit to be able to participate virtually. We'll have a series of events leading up to the um, the uh, advocacy visits the week of March 8th. And I really want to encourage you uh, to sign up, go to the links provided here. Uh, you can reach out to uh, Mark and his team or any of our board members there in Michigan uh, about uh, joining them uh, in the Michigan team for that advocacy. We really want you to do this, uh, to be a part of this effort. Uh, it really helps us make a difference to strengthen these relationships uh, but also protect uh, these policies and this funding that is so critical to preservation activities around the country. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. So you all recognize uh, this friendly face on the screen here. Um, one of the fun things we have done uh, over the last year is um, we've tried to every month or two uh, recognize a key leader uh, in preservation around the country. And uh, this past, this month, uh, we were so pleased to recognize Mark Rodman, uh, your executive director there, uh, because of not just the great work he does uh, for your association, uh, but the great leadership uh, that he uh, displayed uh, during your state tax credit um, challenges and to get that to the finish line 
uh, just a huge congratulations to Mark. And it was, it was uh, great fun to be able to highlight him and his, his fantastic work as a preservation leader. Uh, we would encourage you too, uh, to nominate uh, people for this uh, recognition. And then what we also do is we get closer to the uh, Historic Preservation Advocacy Week. Uh, we'll be voting on a Historic Preservation uh, Action Hero of the Year. Uh, last year, it was Joyce Barrett from Ohio. And uh, again, uh, this great congratulations to Mark. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. A couple of key issues I mentioned uh, briefly uh, early on, but one of the uh, key and critical tools in historic preservation is the Federal Historic Tax Credit. Been around since the 70s and um, in 2017, uh, it was put at serious risk of complete elimination. Uh, the administration uh, recommended that it be zeroed out and eliminated. Uh, the House bill that was passed recommended it be zeroed out and eliminated. And only in the Senate committee uh, where um, the, um, uh, it was put back uh, into uh, the bill, this tax reform bill, and it was saved. It was altered uh, slightly. Uh, but maintained. And so it's just a, a, a great example. Again, uh, if historic preservation leaders and advocates from, uh, from around the country had not come together to make the case uh, that this program, you know, absolutely uh, was critical to uh, saving historic buildings uh, around the country, saving our uh, cultural sites, uh, but it was uh, absolutely a key for economic development and tourism and so many, you know, education and so many other things that are important to our communities. And we were able to successfully make that case uh, to save uh, that critical component. And uh, even now, there have been uh, additional uh, enhancements in the Moving Forward Act uh, to have temporary increases in the tax credit because it's recognized as a uh, economic development engine and job creator. Uh, so again, we have some great data and statistics on that. I'm sure you have some for your um, home state that have been used uh, during your state tax credit debate. And um, we have pending uh, recovery legislation we expect to be coming up uh, in the months ahead with the new administration and the new Congress uh, and additional opportunities to make that case to use uh, this important uh, historic tax credit tool uh, to continue to be part of the overall um, uh, process and targeted way uh, for job creation and economic growth. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, the other uh, key tool uh, that again has been around for, uh, for a very long time is the uh, Federal Historic Preservation Fund. Uh, this fund is uh, funded by uh, small fees on offshore oil and gas exploration goes into this fund. Uh, it has been uh, authorized for uh, up to $150 million a year. Uh, the, on the screen, uh, you can see for the fiscal year uh, 2021 uh, appropriations. Uh, these, uh, you can go down the list here from funding uh, state historic preservation offices for the important work that they do, uh, tribal historic preservation officers, uh, several of the key grant programs on uh, civil rights, underrepresented communities, Save America's Treasures, historic revitalization grants, uh, HBCU preservation programs. So all of these have touched uh, so many areas of historic preservation and 
the great news is, uh, again, there's a, a, a growing and bipartisan recognition of the impact of these programs. And the one thing that really jumps out at you on this slide is we've had uh, record funding uh, and increases for four straight uh, appropriation cycles in a row, even during some of these tough economic times. And it's, again, because we've been able to make the case uh, that this is not just a historic preservation tool, uh, it's an economic development tool. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the picture here is, is an, an example of, of some of the great contacts that uh, we uh, make during Historic Preservation Week. This is in one of the uh, congressional hearing rooms on, on the House side of Capitol Hill, where we're presenting an award to uh, Congressman Darren LaHood uh, with uh, his Illinois Historic Preservation Leaders. And uh, this is uh, the kind of thing that's repeated in state after state, and district after district, when our, uh, our advocates show up for Historic Preservation Week. Um, some snapshots that are unique to Michigan. Let's take a look at this slide. Uh, for our Historic Preservation Caucus, this is a bipartisan caucus, one of the largest uh, in the House. Uh, you have some great bipartisan uh, members of, of the caucus from Michigan in uh, Representative Dan Kildee and Fred Upton. And uh, each year when we uh, make the, the uh, trip and the contacts for Historic Preservation Week, Advocacy Week, uh, we invite uh, members to uh, formally join the Historic Preservation Caucus. And uh, it's just a great collection of people that have expressed that interest uh, in uh, staying in touch on historic preservation issues from their state, uh, but also uh, on the national significance of these programs. Um, a couple other highlights from your state. Uh, notice that uh, Dan Kildee was one of the uh, sponsors, co-sponsors of the Historic Tax Credit Growth and Opportunity Act. And uh, the uh, Dear Colleague letter uh, uh, supporting the Historic Preservation Fund appropriations uh, was signed also by Dan Kildee, Melissa Slotkin, and Senator Stabenow. So uh, again, you've had some really great um, leaders in your state uh, on both sides of the aisle that have stood up uh, for historic preservation. Uh, want to continue to uh, encourage you to nurture those relationships, uh, but also grow others uh, as you get new members uh, and some folks who may not have been involved in historic preservation to reach out to them, uh, share with them the local impact and significance. And I would also encourage you all um, to uh, contact your uh, Senate and congressional district offices that are near you and invite your member or their staff to visit a, uh, a significant uh, historic site that helps tell the story about the impact and importance of historic preservation in their district and how it's important to them. Uh, we've had some real success with that around the country. Uh, members of the staff generally really enjoy doing that, getting to see uh, projects like that uh, in their communities uh, and in people that care about them. Uh, so let's go on to the next slide. So uh, some action steps uh, I would recommend to you all and, and uh, be happy to take questions about these uh, as we get to the end of my slides here. But uh, first of all, um, Mallory had asked the question in the beginning if folks had signed up for our Preservation Action uh, Weekly Legislative Update, and it looked like about 65% of you uh, already were signed up to that. Uh, but if you haven't, please do. Uh, it's free. It's one of the best uh, short reads in preservation that can help you stay up to date on what's going on with preservation. Um, and particularly with, move, with what's going on in Washington, uh, please sign up uh, for the Preservation Action uh, Legislative Update. Uh, secondly, uh, become a member of Preservation Action. Um, you can join as an individual. 
or your, uh, if you're uh, in a historic preservation organization, your organization can join as an ally. Uh, and again, these the network of, of individuals uh, and organizations from around the country is really what makes uh, preservation action strong and effective uh, in that network uh, engaging in advocacy in Washington uh, is really what uh, makes a big difference. Um, thirdly, um, consider joining the board or nominating someone to join the board. Uh, we're fortunate, as I said, we have three uh, strong board members uh, from Michigan now and Nancy Feingood, uh, Kathy McKino and Steve Jones, uh, but it's another additional way uh, that you can contribute. Um, and finally, our major events. Uh, I've stressed a lot about the uh, Historic Preservation Advocacy Week coming up uh, the week of March 8th, uh, but also each fall, uh, we have traditionally done uh, Preservation Action Foundation's auction and party in conjunction with the National Trust um, fall events. And so uh, we did that event last fall uh, virtually for the first time. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was a great success. Uh, but those are our two main events. And we have others throughout the year uh, that not only can you make an impact, but uh, I think it's uh, the networking and, um, and um, education that uh, you can gain from this can also be applied to your local organizations uh, and make an impact in your community uh, and your state. So please check out our, our website. Uh, we're happy to get you engaged. And uh, just finally, uh, really want to encourage you all to uh, join us for Historic Preservation Advocacy Week this year. It doesn't require you to travel to Washington. You can do it from the, the comfort of your uh, laptop computer in your home and uh, can connect with other preservationists in your state uh, and with elected Senate and House members and their staffs from your state and really help make the case. So uh, please join us to be a part of that. We would love to have you and think it will be a really great uh, experience uh, personally and professionally. So please, uh, please join us. And I think we're at the point, uh, is, go to the, is there another slide? Um, but I think we're at the point where we could begin to take some questions. Uh, again, these are some contact uh, contacts where you can reach us. And uh, Mallory, um, it looks like we've got some questions, so I'm, I'm happy to, to jump into those. Yeah, excellent. Um, thank you so much for, again, for going over what Preservation Action does and some of those, um, you know, issues that we have been advocating for um, with a lot of success, um, as you were saying, building those relationships, making sure, you know, the, the HPF fund is, is increasing every year, which is uh, phenomenal. Um, so it's, it's really exciting. You know, we always hear the, oh no, something is, there's work to end something, right? When the tax credit was under threat. Um, and, and so we, sometimes as a preservationist, I always feel like uh, you're just kind of waiting for something terrible to be happening. And like, you have to advocate on that behalf, which does happen. Um, but then through those relationships, right, some really important things um, get done that are really good for preservation. So thank you. Um, so we did have a question come in regarding that national register rule, proposed rule change. Um, so that is not moving forward. Is there any concern that there might be um, individuals still in, in Congress who might want to pick that up again? Or do you think that that is kind of like put to put to bed, so to say? Um, it's pretty well put to bed because this was an administrative uh, rulemaking process initiated by the prior presidential administration. Um, uh, and the administration has changed and has a different viewpoint, but even the, um, even the uh, professionals uh, within the department at the tail end of the last administration uh, stood up to some of the, 
the political appointees uh, that were pushing this and, um, and, and uh, did not recommend it going forward. So again, it really speaks well of the career professionals that were uh, in the department and doing these reviews and that they, they listened to the facts. Uh, they listened to the impact of these programs. And so, um, yeah, I think in, in terms of that uh, process administratively, uh, I think it's pretty much done. Um, and, um, and there's, there's no real, um, there's no real effort within the Congress to uh, do anything like that. Okay, to pick it up. Okay, excellent. Um, as an organization, are there any moves that Preservation Action is doing um, to um, make sure that the historic preservation field um, is inclusive of communities who have uh, often been uh, disenfranchised from preservation? Um, that is something that we have been working on and looking at, but are there any um, anything that you would like to share regarding that topic? Yeah, it's, it really has been, um, for some time, it has been part of our advocacy, uh, but in recent times, it's become an even more important part of our advocacy. And uh, you only have to look at uh, those slides of the programs that are funded uh, through the Historic Preservation Fund uh, in terms of civil rights sites and historically black colleges uh, and other programs uh, that are really, really important at this time. Um, we have had strong support within the Congress uh, for these programs. And we've reached out to some key members of the Congressional Black Caucus and others. Uh, again, it's a very important part of our history that, uh, again, we've been talking about for for many years, uh, but just in these recent times, it's become even more important. And that's been reflected, frankly, in the increased funding for those programs. Right, which is really, really phenomenal. Um, are there, is there, are there any um, increases or new programs that you guys are proposing that you can share or that you're thinking about or in conversations um, to even further strengthen those programs or uh, it's a great question. Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, I'm going to be short on details, though. Uh, again, as you can see, over the last four years, we've gotten increases in um, in the overall program, but uh, virtually all of the individual programs have also been increased. And so uh, that has been our strategy to, uh, in general, to make the point of the, the powerful impact of these programs uh, and that they deserve to have uh, these, um, you know, modest increases as we go along. And, and policymakers and appropriators have been responsive to that. So I, I think we, we have uh, good facts and, and good results on our side uh, for these programs. And if we continue to make that, uh, I think uh, there's a good chance we can, you know, maintain and even gradually grow uh, these programs. Uh, but there's still some conversation uh, about some of the levels for the new uh, appropriations fiscal year, uh, but that's the general approach that we've been taking. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have a question that came in about the historic tax credit um, at the federal level. Um, can you talk about talk more about the future advocacy for the historic tax credit GO in the new Congress. Yeah, the, the uh, historic tax credit growth and opportunity act is, a uh, is uh, really an enhancement to uh, the uh, credit that's has been so successful already. Uh, it does some uh, tweaks uh, to the program uh, to make it uh, more uh, accessible for smaller projects, uh, bumps up some of the, the percentages. Uh, and again, we've, we've really tried to make the case uh, where we have the facts and experience to back it up that this is a important part of any 
you know, national economic development job creation plan, uh, this needs to be part of that. And so um, between the success of the program in preservation and the success that we've seen and track record it has in job creation and economic uh, growth, you know, you can't outsource the jobs that do historic preservation. You know, they come from your local community. Uh, many of the products uh, are products that are made in the U.S. and come from, you know, local suppliers. And so the, the ripple effect of, of those dollars uh, really disproportionately uh, bumps up the economy than some other investments. And so we've, uh, you know, not to mention the data that has been studied time after time that shows the dollars that go into fund federal and state tax credits, we get back uh, more than it cost the, the programs. So again, it, when you put it that way, it should be a no brainer. Uh, but again, it's important to uh, educate policymakers and appropriators on the, you know, on this information. Uh, and uh, I think it's because we've delivered that message and because uh, we've had leaders and organizations from around the country that have localized that message to say, hey, you know, Congressman Kildee, you know, this is the impact this has had in your district in job creation and, you know, number of sites and tourism. I know all those things that really make the case that, you know, uh, uh, somebody who's elected to be a representative, um, one of our jobs is to be a resource. Uh, to provide policymakers with information to make uh, good decisions uh, for the people they represent. And, and so that's, uh, again, I keep going back to the advocacy why I really want to encourage you all. Uh, and um, when I, I saw the number that 90% of you all on the call had contacted your, your, your legislators before, that's great. Um, and so just want to continue all continue to encourage you all to do that locally. Uh, you've got this new uh, success from your state credit. Again, just congratulations. I know there's a lot of work involved with that education and, you know, building alliances, but we, that's a great uh, model uh, for what we've done nationally. And we could sure uh, use your continued help from those of you who have been involved in the past we really want to invite new people uh, to get involved in well as well. So uh, please join us uh, with the Historic Preservation Action, uh, Historic uh, Advocacy Week coming up. Um, so there, um, Rob, one of your, your staffer uh, uh, just sent a, a brief chat that said uh, several provisions of the historic tax credit uh, growth and opportunity were included in the House infrastructure bill in the last Congress. In the new Congress, we know infrastructure and recovery legislation is a top priority for the Biden administration, putting the historic tax credit in a good position. But still, we need advocacy. We need to keep giving people um, our, and our policymakers that information. Um, do you ever find that when you present some of those economic numbers uh, that you were talking about, you know, the, it keeps economic value inside the United States, you can't outsource historic preservation, how, uh, how much more money historic preservation ta uh, tax credits bring in as opposed to the tax credit. Do you find that you um, speak to policymakers and they're really surprised about that? Or do you feel like they already have an idea about that coming into their positions? Now that is a really great question. Um, it, to, the short answer is uh, it varies a lot. I mean, you'd be surprised some, uh, some senators and, and members of Congress and their staffs are, you know, get this stuff and are really good at it and understand it and, and they, they're great champions. Uh, some know just a little bit about it and some don't know much at all. So it just, it really varies dramatically. So obviously we wanna maintain those champions uh, that have been there for us, like Senator Cassidy from Louisiana. I meant to mention him earlier. He was a Senator that really stood up 
during the tax reform debate in 2017 to put uh, the federal tax credit back into the bill. Uh, and had it not been for him standing up to be the champion at that critical time during a committee debate, uh, the program would have been uh, would have likely been gone. Right. Uh, and so what a loss that would have been. So again, those champions are really important. Um, but I think the more we can uh, engage with all of our delegations, um, the better off we are. And particularly some of the new members uh, that are, you know, so many new members coming to this Congress that may not be familiar um, to get them up to speed. I think it's a really super opportunity uh, to engage with those new members and their staffs, uh, introduce them uh, to your state and local organizations and some of their leaders and members uh, to show that there's a constituency there also. I mean, the, the, the obvious point is, um, you know, the constituents are, are the boss, you know, they, they hire and fire their members. And so uh, to know that there's a, a grassroots constituency uh, for these programs, you know, in their districts and in their state, that's a really, uh, uh, maybe a, it's an obvious thing to say, but sometimes people don't understand, I think, or appreciate uh, just how important that is. You know, if there's a, a you know, state or local organizations that can in, invite a member of Congress to come visit a historic site that maybe is, you know, underway or just finished or threatened um, and get a picture of them to put on your social media and, you know, say, you know, we've got X number of thousand, you know, people that we're communicating with about this members who are elected, that perks their ears up. They, they understand that they wanna be able to uh, reach their constituents on issues that they care about. Um, they're, they're, you know, the, the really good members and, and really good staffers are always looking for those kind of opportunities. Right. So uh, I would encourage you all to um, look, and they're always looking for especially after being cooped up with, with COVID, uh, I think uh, there's gonna be a lot of people looking for opportunities, you know, to do, you know, high visible, you know, visits uh, of places in their, in their districts. So again, it's a great opportunity. Uh, one thing we do uh, normally each uh, August, the month of August is traditionally the break from Congress. And we use that as an opportunity to encourage people to invite members to do things like that during their, their big con congressional breaks. Excellent, excellent. Well, we have a few more questions. Um, uh, Russ has agreed to stick on a little bit longer than our two o'clock end time, but um, I wanna make sure that we can, we can wrap up a few more of these. Um, is there, are there any updates on the proposed rehabilitation credit? Are you, um, for the, um, for the homeowner's credit or, or the, if the there, if there's, there, there's, there's several conversations uh, going on about, um, you know, the, the most immediate of which are, uh, if there's additional economic recovery legislation uh, which is a high priority, the new administration and the Congress or infrastructure that uh, those are probably gonna be the first and biggest opportunities uh, to have historic preservation provisions in them. Um, but there's also been ongoing conversation about um, additions to uh, include uh, credits for homeowners uh, and other ways to expand the impact uh, of the credit. And again, those are not as, um, probably not as immediate as some of these uh, other opportunities, but they're, they're very much an important part of, of the conversation. And for, again, building off the, what we know is the success of the credit, uh, looking at other ways it can be expanded uh, to uh, touch even more areas. Okay, excellent. 
Excellent. I did uh, ask the individual who asked that question if they wanted to clarify a little bit more um, that we'll, they'll type in, but thank you. Um, are there any discussions about reinstating funding for Preserve America? Again, I know that uh, that has been a, a point of discussion, um, uh, but I, I've not seen any uh, big head of steam behind that. Um, but I think it's a, it's it's certainly uh, uh, an important uh, important conversation item at this point. Um, is Preservation Action participating in discussions about the Historic Preservation Fund distributions when hitting 65 million? Um, and if so, what is that process that you guys are discussing? I'll just reference my earlier comments. Um, you know, we're bumping up against the, um, the um, total authorization uh, in the fund of $150 million. Uh, and it's been a goal for, you know, many years to, to reach that, you know, to get what's called full funding of, of the money that's, that's put into the fund. And so we're finally getting to that point. And so for these programs to expand uh, beyond some of these levels, uh, it's gonna take an additional debate to uh, raise the cap uh, for the appropriation authorization uh, or do some other creative things. But it's, so it's a good problem to have uh, as we bump up against that um, appropriations cap um, as, as funding has gone up four years in a row, we're finally getting to that point. Uh, so yeah, we're very much engaged in that conversation. And um, myself personally, uh, I think it's appropriate when uh, the reauthorization comes up uh, that we uh, request, you know, raising that cap. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to that. That's not an immediate issue, but uh, it will be coming up uh, before long. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, another question that came up um, or talks about sustainability is asking about sustainability and preservation. You know, in our, um, the current administration has only been um, operating for not even a week, but sustainability <laughs> and, and climate change has really come across as one of their priorities. Um, so we, I know as preservationists, we often use the economic um, reasons for preservation because economics really talks to policymakers. Um, do you see any change in messaging a little bit um, as we go forward with this administration to talk about, um, you know, the most green building is the building that's already built um, and, and those kind of, the, that aspect of the benefits of preservation as well. Absolutely, and, and for those of you in, in involved in preservation, you know this is not a, a new uh, part of the preservation conversation, but, but what is new uh, is I think the, the changing attitudes um, of the American public, uh, the, the, certainly the change in leadership uh, in the Congress and the administration <clears throat> that is, uh, made uh, these issues a, a very high priority. Uh, so it's important, again, the same way that uh, we have focused our advocacy when you know, economic recovery is one of the top issues, we're using you know, our messaging about how we contribute to economic recovery. Uh, so the same thing on sustainability. Uh, if we're talking about sustainability, we need to emphasize uh, the impact of, of historic preservation practices on sustainability. Uh, and part of that conversation is about how do you measure that? How do we come up with a common measurement for uh, embodied carbon? And you know, put that into a value for uh, economic development and sustainability. So I think those are a lot of the really cutting edge conversations going on now um, that, you know, we can all talk about uh, kind of generally how uh, 
those issues work. But I think having some data and having some common uh, measurement methods uh, to put value on that, uh, I think will be, uh, I think will really be necessary uh, to, to move that. Yeah, those are, I mean, that's, that's a good point. There's um, all, a lot of uh, data about economic yeah. impacts, right? Um, and not so much on the sustainability side. So I, I'm very hopeful that there will be some really interesting studies and, and information that we can, um, so that we can use that in, in our in our advocacy and our, you know, our continued arguments that historic preservation is, is good in so many different ways, right? Um, but uh, we did. Um, so before we head out, um, uh, I just want to again remind everybody um, that there will be a link to a survey at the end of this webinar. If you could take a few moments to contribute your thoughts, we'd love to hear back from you. Um, we will be having monthly webinars, um, still working on, on February and March, but keep an eye on our social media and we'll be promoting those there. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're really excited to, to have you and to discuss you know, the upcoming uh, issues at the federal level. And Russ, thank you so much for your time today. We greatly appreciate you uh, spending time virtually with us in Michigan. Um, but before we sign up, um, please uh, take a few moments if you have any uh, last words that you would want to share um, before, before signing off. Uh, just uh, Mallory and, and Mark, thank you for uh, having me virtually. I, I feel like I've, I'm, I'm cooler already so I've been up north with you all. Um, but really, uh, just besides thank you again, just encourage you all to uh, check out the historic preservation uh, work that we do at Preservation Action and uh, just sincerely invite you to join us for what is going to be a very a critical uh, opportunity to advocate with this new administration and new Congress to really make a difference. Because uh, so many of these big things are gonna be happening with economic recovery, infrastructure, sustainability, where your expertise and your local knowledge and your relationships can really make a difference. So please join us and we look forward to engaging with you all um, here in the next few weeks as we gear up uh, for our first ever uh, virtual advocacy week in DC. Right, right. Um, I had the privilege of attending in 2018, which was in person, of course, um, and they do a great job of sharing the information that you need, explaining the issues and helping to prepare you to speak to your, your legislators or their staff person. So um, I, I, echoing Russ, do check out Advocacy Week. Um, you know, in the spring, MHPN has some sort of advocacy uh, event that we are in, currently planning and we'll also keep you all up to date with that as well. So um, if you have any further questions, um, Russ again shared their contact information or you can reach out to us at MHPN. Um, thank you again for your time today and we hope you will join us again in the future. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye.